You guys ready to see who won the Orchid Mantis contest? Um, as it turns out, this is going to take three videos. It was considerably more popular than I had expected, which is a wonderful thing. I counted through how many questions I received through this contest, and it was 179 people. And so what I'm going to do here in a moment is come to the random number generator page here on Google. There were 179 people, and I'm going to hit this generate button, and it's going to change this number over here and pick a random number between 1 and 179. Before I do that, um, because there were 179 questions, um, I, and I answered all of them, and it went on for hours, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this up into three videos. Now, I am going to announce who won the Orchid Mantis, as promised here in a moment, but I'm also going to make a deal with you guys so that you have the opportunity in this first video, um, this has already been determined, but someone is about to win a free Orchid Mantis. In part two, another video, which will be approximately an hour again, you will have an opportunity, or you will already have, um, through asking questions up to this point, you will have already um, earned a sticker. Uh, somebody will win a sticker. And so video one, this one right now, someone's about to win an Orchid Mantis. Video two, I'm going to announce who won the sticker, the second place prize, donated by shapesandnature.com, this Deriplatus labata deadleaf mantis sticker. And then in the third video, I'm going to make a deal with you guys. If you guys um, actually watch enough of these next two videos, this one that you're watching now, and the subsequent one, the second video, I will in the third video offer another Orchid Mantis to one of these 179 people who asked questions. So you will have another opportunity to win. And um, in order for me to uh, provide that second Orchid Mantis, I'm going to ask you guys to watch 30 hours of this first video and then the second video. And that may sound like a lot to you, but if 179 people watched each video, that would be 179 hours per video. I'm just asking for 30. And there were 872 views on this video as of um, midnight here, 12.01 a.m. Um, and so really, if just 30 people watched all of my answers to the question for an hour, that would hit the 30 hour mark. I will say that this video right here where I had announced the contest, we had over 50 watch hours. And so I'm not even asking for that much. I'm just asking for 30 hours for this video and 30 for the next. If you guys watch the answers that I provide to your questions, and I think you'll find them interesting, um, I will donate another Orchid Mantis in that third video. I will pick another winner. Um, I want to say that I really, really enjoyed this contest. It was a lot of fun for me. Um, I have a lot of experience in this hobby, and uh, I owe all of my experience to all of my customers over the years, all of the enthusiasts who I have had conversations with, um, Everything I learned, I learned through networking with other people, whether they were someone I was purchasing from who um, trickled their knowledge down to me, or whether uh, it was a customer who then um, took the dung beetles, for example, that I sold them, and then worked with them, they read the care manuals, they reproduced them, and then they passed knowledge back up to me. Um, I'm constantly learning in this hobby, and um, I have amassed a lot of experience over the years, and that's what these videos are about. Three videos answering your questions. 
And so I'm very grateful that so many people participated. I'm hoping that, um, that this will be the beginning of something that we all enjoy together. And um, I want to restate, as I did in some of the videos here, that um, I would like this to be a weekly thing that we do together where I give away bugs. And so in the comments for this video right here, in addition to you hitting this like button here, if you actually do like this and want to motivate me to keep going, um, I would like for you to ask uh, or to suggest other bugs that you might like to see as part of giveaways in contests like this. Now, this was very time consuming for me. Not only did I make the, in, uh, the introductory video to set the contest up, um, but I also um, answered 179 questions and um, brevity or uh, being quick and short in my answers is not one of my skills. And so it went on for three to four hours probably, which is why I'm breaking it up into three videos. Um, but I, I hope that you find value in all of this and, uh, and enjoy uh, watching it all. And um, in the comments down there, if you want to make other suggestions for how I could either run the contests or um, what bugs you might like to win in a future contest, I will read every single comment, I promise you. And I will respond to what the majority of you want. If it's blue death painting beetles you want, we can do that. If it is, um, you know, centurion roaches, we can do that. If it's Thai rainbow millipedes, we'll make that happen. If it's uh, horrid king assassin bugs, you know, whatever, whatever you guys want to do. So um, that's where I'm going with this channel. I'm going to try to make it as interactive as possible and uh, to do this for you so that you want to watch what I'm putting up here. And so with no further ado, I'm going to hit the generate button on this. And then whatever number comes up here, we are going to count down um, through the 179 people who, who had questions there. And um, we'll see who the winner is. And so the number is 66. And so I'm just going to count down from the top here. Um, I see this one says it was posted three days ago, three days ago, three days ago. Three days ago, three, three. Now this one's two, and this one's two, two. This one goes back to three. So what I'm noting here is that it's not, it wasn't just random in the sense of the Google random number generator. It's also random in how YouTube is presenting these to us. I answered the questions for the most part in chronological order. However, there is another element of randomness here in how YouTube is presenting us with this. And we are just going to work with that because this is already quite complicated and um, I want it to be as simple as possible. So I'm going to do that, do it this way this time and probably do it this way every time. So here we go, counting down to number 66. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65 is Micah. And 66 is Jason Oliveira. What is the most colorful praying mantis? And so Jason Oliveira, you win the orchid mantis. And um, I will appreciate it if enough people watch the remainder of this video, 
where I start to answer the questions that were asked of me, and then definitely tune in for the second video, which I will post probably on Wednesday, um, Wednesday or Thursday, and then I will post another video, the third video, and if we get enough watch time in the um, first video here of answers, and then the second video, 30 watch hours for each one, I will then offer up in the third video, I will mention uh, uh, another winner of an orchid mantis. So um, I just want to say thank you again to all of you for participating and for um, entertaining me this whole weekend through your questions. I really enjoyed them. Um, I think you can tell um, through watching this video, you will see how much passion I have for this and um, you know how much I really enjoy it. So um, hit the like button and um, ask, leave a comment down below about what you want to see in uh, future videos if you have other ideas for how I should run these contests and uh, maybe not answer all these questions. Maybe you have a different idea for how I can do this. I'm totally open to all of that. I want it to be fun for you, and I like variety too, obviously, which is a running theme in all of my videos and why I like insects in general. So um, I'll be waiting for your comments, and I look forward to all of them. Thank you very much. Got another bug shirt here from Shapes in Nature. This is my one-of-a-kind stag beetle shirt. You can see it's sort of my personal color <laughs> to be as neutral as possible. Jesse made this one for me specifically because he knows it's my color. He sells these shirts on shapesinnature.com. He's also doing the Mantis sticker, which I've set too far away now for this contest. Uh, check out his site. Uh, this shirt is normally in a bright green color, which is also quite nice. I'm going to be answering the questions now for the Orchid Mantis contest. Uh, there were a lot of comments here already in the first four hours, which is why I'm getting started now, even though it's about four days from when I actually plan on posting this video. I'm going to try to be as concise and brief as possible in my replies. Uh, a lot of comments here. I'm just going to read the questions in chronological order. We're going to go through these and um, we'll just see how it goes. I may pause the camera at points to run downstairs and grab living props so that we can have a little bit of fun with all of this, but let's just get started here. First question was, what was your first pet bug? And uh, this was by Isabel Knight Inman. I'm going to uh, pronounce some of the names rather poorly. I apologize in advance for that. I'm just going to do my best. Um, and uh, I actually covered this topic about my first pet bug in uh, one of the last three videos, the question and answer ones from Instagram. And so, you might pop back here on YouTube and uh, look at that. The answer is sea monkeys, and I explain why in a prior video. Next one is, uh, they work for a pest control company, and uh, do I think that, I'd actually like to hear your thoughts on pest control companies. Do I think they are more harmful or helpful? Um, as I've said in prior videos, I'm a human being, and um, I'm a great advocate of human beings and their right to uh, have a place in this world. And, you know, I mean, we are a dominant species that displaces other things. And it's unfortunate in some regards that um, we uh, are so destructive in our ways, but I'm also very pragmatic. Here we are, this is what we've done. We didn't really know what we were doing. We are just babies, you know, operating these human brains and now just starting to come of age, you could say, and to look around us and to see what, uh, what effect we are having on the world around us and all of the organisms and how they are connected to each other and what effect we have on everything. So, um, I understand and accept that it is, um, you know, people don't want bugs on the loose in their house. It's a cleanliness issue. Um, a lot of people are afraid of bugs of various kinds, spiders, roaches, 
Um, some people are allergic to roaches, for example. Um, I, I understand why uh, there have to be pest control companies. Um, you know, some, some are destructive and will eat the wood in your houses. Um, what I don't like and the education that I always try to give to the people that come to the door to sell me their uh, blankets of death is that um, there is not actually anything on my property, um, nor will there probably ever be. Uh, I live in Oregon, and so uh, we don't have a lot of destruction happening here. The pest control companies are typically trying to sell fear. It's propaganda. They come to your door and try to scare you and talk to you, not just about what your neighbors are seeing and the service that they are providing to them because of the spiders or the stink bugs or whatever. Um, and not, not only that, but the chemicals or even uh, less destructive chemicals like pyrethrum, I guess it is, maybe made from chrysanthemums or something like that. You know, it, it either kills things or deters them, but it doesn't just target the organisms that they are telling you that are dangerous. Uh, it targets everything, and so it displaces everything. And I feel like living here in a house that someone else built and on a property that somebody else landscaped, that, you know, I'm, I'm already doing enough as one person just in this small little space that my body takes up in this very large house and on this large piece of property um, you can see behind me in the past videos, it's very green and beautiful. There's a green space and a creek down the hill here. Um, I'm very protective of all of that um, outside of just what I do here, uh, just, just being a person living here. Um, so, um, not a fan of uh, the way pest control companies market their products. Uh, I understand that they have to make a living and um, you know, it is what it is. I, I accept that it's a part of the world, but um, when they come to my door and try to sell me personally this fear and propaganda, I send them away um, with the knowledge that there is nothing in our area and nothing on my property in particular that is either dangerous to me or the property itself. And so they can take their fear and their propaganda <laughs> elsewhere. Um, I'm going to try not to uh, take that much time to answer these questions, but you know, you, you asked a question there that uh, I think about frequently uh, as I go through life. Um, next one here is, uh, do I have a favorite drawing that we've done? Oh, I needed a little more time to think about this one. Um, some of you know that we do drawings for customers. It's actually very time consuming and I, I've been promoting it less lately because I pay an employee to do these drawings and often the order that is placed is, uh, is low in profit in the first place, you know, a single bug or two and then I pay an employee for a while to do a drawing and it's great for promotional on Instagram and YouTube and things like that and it's a lot of fun and we always uh, crack up about it and everything, but um, I, I do stay very busy with my business. And so um, one, one that's coming to mind right now, and th uh, there's a bunch actually, but uh, uh, Jessica, who works for me, uh, at Miss Amina on Instagram, she drew a pair of dung beetles partying under a disco ball that, uh, and she used like glitter pens and the, the uh, the crystal ball was a dung ball and they were dancing under there and um, you know she she was like moving the paper and making it dance and I was like zzz, 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 making the techno music and everything and it was a lot of fun I think we probably had some live dung beetles there too um, moving on uh, did I how do you how did I get into my profession and did I study entomology or anything like that now um, study you know i am constantly studying entomology um since i was very young and had my golden guides and my simon and schuster's field guide and my audubon society field guide and paying attention to everything out there um 
I am always very careful not to uh, frown upon citizen science and um, I'm always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm any, anybody that is studying something, whether it's a recipe that you're uh, reading on Google, you know, that's, that's a food science in a sense. You're learning all the time. We're all learning all of the time. And so um, I don't have a formal education in entomology um, in the same way that I never enjoyed basketball practice and yet basketball was my favorite sport to play when I was younger. I never played on a basketball team because I didn't enjoy the practices. But if I was just out on, you know, at the playground or at the park, playing basketball was my favorite sport. Um, very similar with entomology. Uh, I did go to college for six years, but the act of opening up a book about um, you know, the veination of wings and what they name all the cells with the letters and the numbers and median this. And it's all very complicated and deep detail to a point where, much like chemistry, which I always found much less interesting than biology, um, the, the details about the, the molecules and the atoms in them and how many of them there are, these aren't things I can see with my eyes. And so I'm all about the instant gratification. I want to go outside and I want to see nature and I want to see as much of it as I can. And I sometimes say I want to shake hands with it, learn its name, and then move on and meet the next organism. And so you'll, you'll hear that theme come up a lot when I talk. Um, so, you know, to, to, to call this study or uh, their, another part of their question was, or is it more of a hobby that you're really good at? Um, it's, it's a little bit of both. I, I study it. Um, you know, I speak with entomologists all the time who email me because they specialize in a particular thing, like maybe roaches or um, how roaches move even more specifically. And so they're asking me questions um, about, you know, a different group of insects because it's outside of their narrow field of study, which is another reason that I never went into entomology as a science, um, you know, as a career in the typical way, um, because I didn't want to specialize. I'm interested in the largest, most broad, not too deep uh, topic. And I, I want to talk to everybody. I want to meet the specialist and spend the day with them and learn as much as they can tell me in a 24 hour period. And then I want to move on and I want to see something else and talk to somebody else about, you know, what they've devoted their life to. Um, so I'm going to move on. I think I answered that to my own satisfaction, at least. Um, do I have experience with lepidopterans? I actually answered this one on the page already. Um, I'm going to try to get into the mantis keeping hobby. What species would you recommend by Tetra Morium? was the user. Um, I answered this question in a prior video too, it was the spiny flower mantis, but as I've also said before, it almost doesn't matter which mantis you start out with. The reason that they're available in the hobby in the first place is because somebody else reproduced them, which more than likely means, and especially if it's a species you see sort of regularly available, it means that it's a rather easy species to reproduce because if it was difficult, it wouldn't be so often available. And so you just look at it from that perspective. Most of them are not difficult if you follow the most basic care sheets, humidity, food, um, the proper setup. I mean, it's really just that easy. Um, next question, a quad, a quad insect. Were there any tough moments in the hobby when you questioned your decision to enter the hobby? I never questioned entering the hobby. Um, I was amazed because all of a sudden there was this internet and I was like, you know, what, what can I do with this? And so I just went to where I've always gone. I typed in bugs and then shortly after the, uh, the internet came into existence, I put up a website as I sometimes <laughs> like to say, because it puts things in perspective. My website went up a year before Google was a search engine. Um, did I ever give up? You know, that's an interesting part of the question. Um, in between my marriages, I'm not married, but in between the two marriages I've had, I did briefly 
move a lot of my bugs into a storage unit where they did not fare so well because they were in there for a few months and uh, I, I, <laughs> it's a long story. I put them in the wrong storage unit, uh, a whole bunch of Star Wars and uh, sports cards that I had got stolen within the first 24 hours and uh, it made me sick to even think about going back there to feed my bugs at that point. But anyway, and I lived in, in you know, over the river a long way from the cheapest storage unit I could find at that time, which turned out to be a huge mistake in so many ways. But anyway, um, so uh, I did briefly give the hobby up um, when I lived in an apartment for a couple of years. Um, I never gave up working on my website and taking pictures of bugs. And so it was still a huge part of me and a part of my daily existence. But I stopped keeping uh, pet bugs for the most part. I still always had a few, but I mostly stopped giving them up uh, or stopped um, keeping them. Uh, growing up, how supportive was your family of my love of insects and bugs? Um, this is a topic that, I, that I'm not going to do justice here in the context of a brief answer. Uh, they were entirely supportive, 100%, and they still are. And uh, I will expand on this sometime when there aren't so many questions. But uh, family is everything, and um, the support that parents and family give to children, um, regardless of what they're interested in, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the belief because I've made a life out of doing what I love to do. And um, that's, that's something I personally feel that everybody should aspire to because, you know, I worked at UPS for 19 years. I know what it's like to go to work every day and to do something that you may not hate, but you know, it's the grind. It's the daily grind. You're going there and um, you know, it's hard to, hard to get out of bed. You're exhausted at the end of the day. It takes a lot out of you. And so, um, you know, I, uh, I definitely think that all parents should uh, fully support whatever it is, regardless of what it is, what their children are interested in. So that they can, so that they can have that foundation for pursuing their dream, even if their dream changes and changes and changes, which a lot of people do. A lot of people never figure it out. A lot of people, you know, figure it out through doing a bunch of other things. Um, but until you sort of practice following your dream, um, you're, I don't think you're ever going to be able to get to those next levels unless you have that support system early. So. Um, Let's see, when you feed your mantises, do, I, do you find it hard to watch? They love their mantises, but they generally walk away. Um, did I ever get attached to a housefly? Uh, I've never gotten attached to a housefly. Um, interestingly, I've gotten attached to very few bugs. Um, I'm constantly taking care of them and selling them, letting them go. That's what I do. And so um, perhaps it has something to do with that. Um, I'm still upset about a tarantula that died a long time ago, which I'll talk about another time perhaps. But um, I don't find it hard to watch a living fly being consumed by a mantis whatsoever. Um, that's the simple answer to the question. I could expand on that uh, infinitely probably and will at some point, I'm sure. What got you interested in keeping bugs in the first place? Uh, really quick answer to this question too. I get this question a lot on Instagram. I enjoy it. Um, it it's a simple function of uh, being a child inside a house and um, my parents letting me out in the backyard and I'm looking around and I feel the warm sun on my skin and I hear the birds chirping and I see the flowers blooming and I'm sitting there and basically just watching the grass grow and the clouds move across the sky. And there isn't a whole lot happening besides just that blissful moment, which isn't so bad. But then a bug comes by and another bug comes by and a, a butterfly lands on a flower and I hear a bee buzzing and I see uh, isopods, pill bugs and sal bugs crawling across the ground and I see a spider spinning a web and there's just so much nature happening around me. And these are the things out there in this beautiful environment that's not dark and gloomy like the house might have been. And 
they're, they're all out there moving around and it's fascinating. It's always been fascinating. It's always going to be fascinating. Um, are mantises able to fly? Yes, they are. Uh, males fly better than females. Not all mantises have wings, so not all mantises can fly. But if you see wings on a mantis, it's safe to assume that it can fly. Older females that fill up with eggs become very heavy, and so they, at best, can sort of glide downwards from a high point to a low point. Um, you won't see a lot of female mantises taking to the wing from a ground position, unlike males, which are um, evolved to fly off and find the females. So even in species where the females may have reduced wings or bud wings, um, the males of those same species will often be winged and much lighter bodied, um, which allows them to fly better. What made me fall in love with insects and invertebrates? Was it from a child or a special moment? I, I answered that question just a moment ago, I would say. Um, this next one here, I am going to go downstairs and get an insect, not an insect, but an arachnid to bring up and show you. So I'm going to pause the camera. <laughs> All right, the next question was, with the growing understanding in recent years of solifuges, life cycles, and needs, do you think they will eventually become more prominent and accessible in the hobby? And generally, these arachnids are not very, um, good in captivity. Um, I don't recommend keeping them as pets because more often than not, they tend to die within a few days, um, a few weeks, and so they're not suitable to captivity. However, back in July, now four and a half months ago, uh, during our trip to Arizona, I collected this specimen right here, and it manages to be alive still. Let's see if we can zoom in here. Take a look at this beautiful, sometimes people call them camel spiders. And it just slid right off my hand. It's not going to be easy to pick back up again. Got kind of lucky there. Where are you? There you are. I don't know. There we go. So this is a wind scorpion or a camel spider. Um, sun spider, that's the other name people sometimes call them. Or solifuges or solifugids. Um, possibly the <laughs> most names out of any kind of arthropod. So one of the interesting things about these that I've never seen documented anywhere, you can see that this one's having difficulty getting its footing. Um, it's shocking that it's lived all of this time, uh, to be honest. But um, those darker front legs, which are also sort of unusual in this specimen, that they're darker, um, those aren't actually legs. They're pedipalps. And uh, it was doing something very interesting with its front pair of walking, the walking legs there. There's four pairs, um, which is what makes it an arachnid that it has eight, eight legs. But um, these two pedipalps up here, they actually have this little sticky material, white sticky material that comes out the ends. And I've seen them kind of ladder up. Uh, I don't know, let me zoom zoom out here again. They sort of use those and they will stick it. To, I've seen them climb up smooth glass just like this, one after the other. It's really quite remarkable. I'm going to put this little one away here. And, uh, feel free to ask for an update on that specimen again sometime because it'll be interesting to see if it's still alive. Um, they will never be prominent in the hobby, I, I don't believe, but, you know, anything can happen. Um, 
I've cared for Asian mantises, several species of tarantulas, death fainting beetles. What are some other awesome pet inverts that you feel are underrated? Well, I mean, I don't know about underrated, but you mentioned mantises, tarantulas, and beetles. Um, there's a bunch of other beetles. Uh, uh, rhino beetles would be a good one. A couple dynasties that come through my website, both natives to the U.S., big rhino beetles. It's pretty cool. Um, stag beetles, like the shirt. Uh, millipedes, there's a variety of millipedes available in the hobby. Um, you didn't mention scorpions. Uh, scorpions are probably my favorite group of arachnids. Spoiler alert. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, do I remember which critter sparked my interest in the world of entomology? Kind of covered that already. Um, person asks, uh, this is Tina Fox, as far as the mantis goes, when they create their egg nest slash sack, um, in spiders, in arachnids, we tend to call them egg sacks. In insects, we tend to call them egg cases. Um, I don't mind people calling them whatever they want to, though. I just appreciate that they're interested in the topic at all. Um, somebody says, how many eggs can there be in one nest? Um, it really depends on the species. It depends on how well the uh, mother has been fed. It depends on the age of the mother because mantises can may lay multiple egg cases and the older they get, the smaller they tend to be. It may also depend on how recently the female was fertilized. She might be fertilized and then lay an egg case and then lay another egg case. Um, and there will still be fertilization in the eggs in the next egg case too. So, it, but it might be smaller. Um, and can they survive in colder temps? Uh, yes, they can. If it's a species that is native to your environment and you live in a place that gets very cold in winter, then uh, better than we can, the animals are very adapted to living in the cold, you know, for millions of years, of course. So, um, the answer to that question is yes, and to take it a little further, uh, there are some species that require diapause. Their egg case will not hatch unless it experiences a necessarily long uh, uh, temperature and light period. So um, it's absolutely critical in some cases that they go through those darker, colder months in order to um, have a normal life. How long have I been breeding insects and when did you get an interest into the insect world? Also, what's your favorite roach species? Mine are you, the Labyrinth species ivory. Um, it's a lot of questions. Uh, I probably didn't start breeding insects until I started keeping phasmids back in the 90s. Uh, when did you get an interest into the insect world? Uh, that was, you know, earlier than I can even remember. My favorite roach species. Um, I, I don't pick favorites and I'm not going to spend time uh, justifying that here. Uh, I, I'll answer that question again at some point, I'm sure. Um, people always seem to ask about how a hobby starts, but I'm curious, what drives your love for bugs nowadays? Um, the simplest way to answer this question is to say that um, this, everything I'm doing here, this is my identity. It's just who I am. And I could give you another five minutes on what that means, but that will sum it up. We've got a lot of material to cover here. My, what is my dream invert? I covered this in the last contest. I would say, uh, just for the sake of having an answer, um, that it's Titanus giganteus, a giant stag beetle from South America. Um, someone wants to know how hard the orchid mantises are to keep. I've wanted one for ages, but I don't know very much about them. As I alluded to previously, um, orchid mantises are very simple. Um, there will be some questions down below, I think, where people asked about whether um, they're easy to breed or not. And that's where orchid mantises are tricky. The females are this big, as you saw in the video clip later um, in the same question or the same contest video. Um, if some of you only watched the beginning where I spoke for like eight minutes, I don't blame you for not finishing it necessarily. But later in the video, I think the last, I don't know, 10 minutes or something, there were a lot of clips of orchid mantises. So go back and check that out. And you can see that the females are this big, the mantises, the males are about this big. 
And so often the female will see these smaller males as snacks more so than in other species, and that presents difficulties in breeding. Um, also, the males mature much more quickly than the females, which is one of the reasons why orchids are not available very commonly in the hobby. Um, it's hard to start out with a group of them and have the females and males mature at the same time because the males mature so much more quickly. Uh, there's some other reasons too, but those are the highlights. I will do another video on orchid mantises at some point, no doubt. Um, out of all, this person's favorite insect in the United States is the regal moth. What is my favorite insect in the United States? I can't pick one. I don't have to. I'm not going to. Not this time. Sorry. Uh, are butterworms a good feeder? I think I answered that um, on the page itself. I've not personally used butterworms as a feeder for a larger mantis. I would recommend offering a diversity in the diet. Um, I think those might be high in fat content or something, as I recall. Um, probably good for a treat, probably good as a supplemental food, but um, offer your mantises what everybody else is offering their mantises in terms of common feeders. Um, how do I maintain humidity in the 32 ounce cups? Um, a 32 ounce cup is about this size and people often raise their mantises in those. Uh, the 32 ounce cup is sort of the standard actually for keeping mantises. It's also the size of the fruit fly cultures, the large ones that many of you will be familiar with. And the way that you keep them humid is you place some substrate down in the bottom of that and you just spray that every day or every two days or twice a day, depending on how quickly the moisture, the humidity is evaporating out through the normal uh, fruit fly culture or mantis habitat lid. Um, they have a, a paper, uh, it's called polyfiber up on the top and um, air transfers through it as does humidity to some degree. And so you will want to, based on the temperature of your home, the dryness of your home, spray it more or less frequently on that basis. Um, take care of your pet, give it what it needs in terms of humidity and pay attention to how quickly it's evaporating in the containers you're using based on the specific conditions in your home and the microclimate that is your mantis container. When will you have Thai rainbow millipedes back in stock? This presents an interesting opportunity here to let you know that often just because something is out of stock on my website, it doesn't actually mean that it's out of stock completely. I list everything conservatively so that pet stores and people that are setting tables up at reptile shows and things don't buy out everything, leaving you, the people that I care about, with nothing. And so I list things conservatively. I also have a couple different websites. Um, the one for living insects is bugsincyberspace.com and um, there are so many listings on all of these websites that if I only have like five of something left, I don't kill myself over listing every single little thing on the website all the time when I know that it's going to be alive and surviving, doing just fine a couple weeks later when I get around to it or somebody's going to ask, do you have more Thai rainbow millipedes? And I'm gonna say, you know, yeah, I do. So just you know, communicate with me. Um, I get slammed with emails and correspondence. I do my best to answer every email, um, but I stay really busy. And uh, I suppose I'll take this opportunity to apologize when I am not able to answer every single email where somebody is wanting a couple of this or a couple of that. It's very overwhelming. I've had my website up for about 22 years now and I just do my very best to keep up with the requests. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the position where I don't have to um, kill myself and, uh, you know, just, just to sell a couple things of this or that because I have a lot of people coming at me all the time. And I'm grateful for that. Um, and I keep my prices low and I work all day so that, um, you know, I, I can continue to provide all these insects and millipedes and spiders and things at a cheap price that makes it affordable for you. I could raise all of my prices, hire more help. I'm constantly asking myself, you know, should I do that? But, you know, I, I just do what I do and I do it my way and I enjoy it. And um, that's the whole point of having your own business, your own home business is to be happy. And so that's the default setting that I uh, strive for. 
Um, what are some downsides of keeping mantises? I hear a lot of people complaining about the short lifespan. Um, that's really uh, the complaint that I hear the most. The thing that deters people the most from considering a pet mantis. Um, I don't see it that way at all. I actually see their short lifespans as a plus, not a minus. And uh, the reason for that is because um, if the average human, the average person in the United States, my customer base, lives for 80 years and you have a dog, you, you have a dog that might live 10 years, through the course of your life you might have eight dogs unless you have multiple dogs at once. So that's, that's eight pet experiences you are going to have. If you have a mantis for a year, 80 times, you get to have 80 pet experiences. I see short lifespans actually as a positive. <laughs> so I want to see everything. I want to experience everything. That's always been the game for me. That's the experience that I think a lot of people don't have a perspective on. They don't consider that they are limiting themselves. Now, I do understand the, uh, the more deep relationship that you can have with a dog or a cat, you know? Um, but that's not for me. That's, that's not, I don't want that kind of commitment. I want something very low maintenance in my life. I want lots of low maintenance things. I want to pay attention to it. And I, on my terms, you know, I walk over to its cage, I offer food to it. It's not um, barking and um, needing me to take it out on a walk and I'm not having to reach my hand into that plastic bag and get a handful of that warm stuff that uh, is a result of the food that I left for it earlier, yada, yada, yada. You get the point. Um, there's no downsides to keeping mantises, come on. Uh, next question. I've read that, Darwin, that Charles Darwin believed that insects were capable of showing emotions such as anger, jealousy, love. I hit on this topic a little bit um, in a subsequent video, so I won't go too long on this. Um, have I witnessed any of the behaviors of anger, jealousy, and love um, emotions in insects? Um, whew. So I don't, I wouldn't call them emotions at all. I, I see traits in them, responses in them um, that seem more to me like a function of programming and um, you know biological factors of cause and effect. So if I put my finger down on the foot of a mantis, it will not through anger or through um, you know uh, being upset or anything like that, it, it will try to pull away from me. And if it cannot first pull away from me, the next thing it will do would be to strike. And if the striking and grabbing my finger that is pinning its foot down does not, uh, if its striking does not cause me to pull away, it will then do the only other thing it can do, and that is to bite my finger. Um, I have never personally been bitten by a mantis, uh, amazingly. <laughs> I have seen it happen to other people with my own eyes, though. But um, I, I don't ascribe emotions to insects. And, um, but I, I have no problem with people who do. I have no problem with people deciding that what makes them happy is to have a relationship where, you know, they feel that the mantis is loving them back as much as they are because um, reality is subjective anyway. Uh, reality is what you make of it. And so for me, the reality that makes me happy is the one that I've cultivated for myself. Um, you know, you can talk to scientists about, you know, what they feel um, is true about all of these things if you want to, but, um, you know, they, they will probably align themselves with my perspective on it um, or the perspective that I have, not because it's, you know, my perspective. But, um, you know, the, people don't really know um, how animals in uh, general um, experience the world around them. Um, you will know from your own experience that being human is very complicated and we can feel 
one way one minute in a completely different way the next minute and we can stop ourselves from feeling one way one minute or the phone rings and it's a cause of stress or the phone rings and it's a cause of excitement it's hard enough understanding ourselves um, trying to understand animals is is a is something that i don't spend a lot of time thinking about uh, despite the very long answer um how did I get into bugs, not just as a hobby, but as a career? I put my website up many years ago. I have, uh, I'll expand more on this at another point too, but it is as simple as uh, I put my website up to provide information to people. Um, I was trading material back and forth with people. I had suddenly a whole bunch of things. People said, can I trade you this? I say, I already got that. People said, I can tra trade you this. I say, I don't want that. People say, um, well, then can I buy from you? And I'm like, no, I don't do that. And then they ask again, and they ask again, and someone else asks again, and I'm like, okay, I'll try that. And you know, the rest is history. Um, what do I consider the cutest bug? Um, that's like asking what my favorite bug is. Um, cutest bug. You know, there, there are moments where I can answer a question like that. Um, this isn't one of them, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of bugs are cute to me. Uh, jumping spiders, for example, despite being spiders, they are uh, so adorable that even spider haters, a huge percentage of people who hate spiders with a passion, can look at a jumping spider sometimes under the right circumstances and say, hmm, that's... I can't believe I'm saying this, but that's cute. So we'll leave it at that. Um, someone else, and I'm gonna read this whole one because I like it. Ezekiel Ortega says, you have made me see insects way more than just random annoying bugs. I actually take the time to research and see what a specific specimen's job is. Thank you, Peter, for that. My question is what still drives you to keep following this career? I touched on that a bit ago. I said, I said it's become my identity. It's just who I am. I, uh, I no longer have friends who aren't interested in bugs because I talk to people who love bugs all the time. And in many cases, they love bugs as much as I do. And so, you know, I, I don't want to go talk to people about sports or, um, you know, gardening or things that I don't do, even though I could be interested in those topics and I've been interested in them in the past. I just want to talk about bugs all the time because that's who I am. And that's, those are the kinds of people I like to surround myself with. And so what drives me is, um, it, it's, it's just who I am, it's just who I am. What is the most enjoyable mantis species to own in your opinion? I covered that in the last, uh, a series of videos, I highly recommend the spiny flower mantis or the reasons there. Um, have I ever tried raising red-eyed predatory katydids? And uh, sometimes people call those uh, arid lands katydids, Neo Beretia spinosa, and then I think Victori is the other uh, species, two large giant katydids that basically grab every other insect and arthropod around them and uh, almost like a mantis does with these spiky forelegs, and then they bring it to their mouth and with red eyes, feed on it. It's, uh, it's remarkable. Um, I have kept them. I have not raised them generationally. I would uh, love to have some more right this second. <laughs> uh, what insect are you drawn to the most? Uh, too vague a question, moving on in the interest of time. What's one insect you wanted to keep for a while but haven't yet? This is from Kevin Withers. Um, his name just caught my eye there. It's someone who seems quite involved in the pet bug hobbies. I see his name all the time. So anyway, thanks for the question, Kevin. Um, one that I've wanted to keep for a while but haven't yet. Um, man. Okay, metal mantises. I would like to keep them. I think you're a mantis guy, so I'm going to throw that one at you. Um, that would be a good one. Uh, what's the most rewarding part of owning an orchid mantis? I mean, they're beautiful. They're so beautiful. Pink and white mantises with lobes that look like the petals of an orchid. Um, 
and you put them in a tank with orchids, like orchids, like so many stores sell orchids now. You go get yourself an orchid and put a mantis in there and it's the most beautiful thing in your house immediately. That's my answer. Thank you, Cajun cutie. <laughs> um, on a scale of one to 10, how easy is it to breed the orchid mantis? Um, with one being easy and 10 being hard, I would say it's an obvious 10. And well, okay, I'm gonna say it's a nine. 10 would be like impossible, I suppose. It's a nine because they are so valuable and if it were easy, the market would be flooded with them. And um, well, I would probably have been making YouTube videos long ago and um, not be doing some of the other things I do as a, as a matter of business because I love this YouTube stuff. And uh, if, if I could just do whatever I wanted to do because the money was flowing in and uh, money was not a concern, making money was not a concern, um, I, I would just do YouTube videos because this is what I love the most. So uh, they're very difficult or everybody would have them. Um, can some mantises molt more than others in their lifetime or is it a set amount? Uh, males will, in many cases, molt fewer times than females, and I believe different species will molt a different number of times. What is the most treasured bug in your collection, if any, and why? Um, just because they are the most valuable, my rhino roaches would be high on the list of things. The orchid mantises, when I'm able to breed them, um, those are very treasured to me because I have to pay my bills. I have to pay my bills. Do you name any of your bugs? Um, not really. Uh, every once in a while I will uh, donate some bugs to uh, Portland Insectarium, a local company that Jessica, who works for me, operates. And they will leave the house without a name and they will be returned to me with a name. And um, I often forget those names. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't really... So, so because, because Jessica would do that sometimes, there were times where I wouldn't let the bug leave the house without giving it a name myself because I didn't want it to be returned with, you know, some name like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, Sparkles or something like that. Uh, she picks really great names. I'm not trying to uh, uh, rip into her for the names she chooses because um, she chooses names on the basis of, you know, like if it's a tarantula, she'll give it a really cute name because that starts to, um, you know, affect the way the people that are uh, coming to her events feel about it. If it has this, it's a, a large tarantula that might normally be a source of um, fear to people. It has this cute name and she's holding it, you know, it starts to soften the edges of the experience for people a little bit if they're um, timid. They also asked how big my personal collection was. This is Christina. Um, there's no answer to that question. There's just no answer. Um, my collection is different today than it was yesterday, different than it will be tomorrow. Uh, that's a cop out, sorry. Do you believe that it should be a part of humanity's goal to study and try to understand all that nature has to offer, including these beautiful insects? Um, this is Cursed Plantera on uh, Instagram, Nick Fuentes. Um, do I believe it should be a part of humanity's goal to study and try to understand all that nature has to offer? Um, it's a philosophical question. Um, I think that every individual person has to choose their own path, but I do believe that um, a respect for nature is a source of happiness for me. And because it's a source of happiness for me, um, and because I've talked to lots of people through the course of my lifetime, I think that nature is intrinsically important to our own well-being, um, being able to see it, being able to go out into it, being able to escape in it. Um, you know, it's, it's, such, it's such a deep topic to discuss, but um, I do think that, um, you know, that, that global warming, for example, is a real thing whatever its cause is, we, people argue about its cause, people may deny it completely, but I, I mean, the planet is warming, whether you want to believe it's natural warming or caused by uh, human beings. 
um, it doesn't really matter because we, we are experiencing a crisis. Living things on this planet are dying. Ocean levels are rising. Um, temperatures are going up. Um, you know, the, you, you look at the, uh, the ice sheet above Canada, uh, the Arctic, and it's shrinking. Um, these, these are real concerns and the animals on this planet um, need all of the help that we as humans can give them. And um, that's not just in their best interest, it's in our own best interest for lots of reasons that I could go into more detail on, but won't in the interest of time. Um, I found that male and female ghost mantid nymphs have very different mannerisms in terms of being handled accepting food. Have you seen this when you raise them in captivity? I've definitely noticed that adult males are very timid and um, they are often reluctant feeders. Um, you know, small nymphs, certainly uh, I have not noticed any differences in the behavior of males and females when they're small. As they get older, I would say that uh, males become more timid as compared to females. Um, what's one of the insects that I've had the worst luck raising? Um, don't exactly believe in luck. Uh, cause and effect and then random chance. But when you're taking care of an animal, um, we, don't, we don't leave things to luck, of course. It is our responsibility as keepers to provide everything that they need. Everything. And so, um, one thing that I have failed with repeatedly are devil's flowers, uh, a kind of mantis. Um, and I say devil's flowers, not devil's flower mantises on purpose. They are just called devil's flowers. Uh, flower mantises are something else. Um, and so uh, they need so much heat and uh, I've never started with a really big group of them. Um, I've had good numbers of them, but I have always failed to uh, to provide the cages that they need or humidity at the right time with the smallest groups of them I've kept to the point where that's one species that has eluded me in terms of reproducing it in captivity. So uh, that's a quick and easy go-to answer. Um, how hard is it to breed the orchid mantis? I already answered that. What kind of conditions would be optimal? Uh, basic conditions that you can read on my Bugs in Cyberspace Mantis care sheet. How often uh, will they deposit egg cases every couple of months? Uh, how many offspring will be generated? Um, it depends on the size of the egg case, which depends on how well you're feeding the mantis, um, whether it's been fertilized more than once, how old the mantis is, but you can expect up to a hundred babies, I would say, and uh, as few as, you know, uh, just a couple, depending on whether you're incubating the egg cases properly as well. Sometimes they won't hatch at all if you don't do things right. What bug adaptation do you think is the most interesting? Flight, flight, flight. What is the one thing you wish everyone knew about insects? And what is the most underrated pet insect or arachnid? Um, I really, I, I want to answer the second question and say, I think vinegar rooms uh, are very underrated. They are so alien looking and yet so harmless. They are so sizable and so easy to care for. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that my answer this time. What is the one thing you wish everyone knew about insects? Such a broad question. Um, I, I am, believe it or not, it, it's never my purpose to try to um, compel people to experience what I experience. Everybody needs to find their own path. Everybody needs to figure out where happiness is for them, um, to follow their dream, to pay attention to what interests them. Um, I just like bugs. And you're watching this video because you like bugs. And so, you know, it's just you and me. I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't need everybody to know what, you know, something about insects. I just enjoy them and, um, you know, that's, that's all it is for me. I have seen orchid mantises of the same color, but I have seen different shaped abdomens. Is this due to sexual dimorphism? Absolutely, um, there is a dimorphism, two shapes, dimorphism, two shapes. Males are very different in shape uh, to females in that species and in many insect species. 
How much heat do orchid mantises need? Um, 80 degrees is a good target, a little warmer than room temperature. Um, is it true that a mantis learns to recognize different humans? I would say absolutely not. They said they heard this while visiting the Bug Zoo in Canada. If it's the one in Victoria that you're talking about, I've been there, it's a fantastic place. When you are looking for insects, do you have a hard time finding them? <laughs> I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, I don't personally believe that a mantis will recognize people. Um, you are entitled to believe whatever you wanted to have the best possible mantis experience you can have. So I don't mean to rain on your parade or to, um, you know, discount the wonderful experience that anybody had with their pet. But just me personally, um, I don't feel that I've ever been recognized by a mantis. And um, you have to understand that I work with hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of mantises every week. And um, there are other people who work with me who also handle them. And I have never made any observations that led me to believe that a mantis was treating me any better or worse than they were treating um, somebody else. So um, when you are looking for insects, do you have a hard time finding them? No. That's why I like insects, because they are not difficult to find, as I mentioned in a previous video uh, last week. Um, birds, I love birds, but you can't, you can't get close to them, so I, I do bugs. <laughs> um, someone says, what pet bug would you recommend for an intermediate bug keeper? Um, I mean, the blue death feigning beetle, uh, I said that in my very last video. That's always one of my top recommendations. Hissing cockroaches are very popular. Um, millipedes of all kinds. The ivory millipede is one of my favorites to recommend because they're long-lived, easy to care for, and attractive. I could go on and on. How long of parts are? Orchid mantis molts usually. Good question. Um, there's no set point. Um, there's a lot of variability. Uh, the mantises are forgiving of your poor care practices. <laughs> and I don't mean you specifically who asked this question, but um, they make good pets because they are very forgiving of uh, going long periods of uh, not being offered food. Um, and it, a lot of pet bugs are like that. Uh, we don't make the trips to the pet stores in many cases. I, I don't go to pet stores, but. Um, a lot of keepers don't go to pet stores as often as they should, and so um, they're not feeding. They'll like bulk feed their reptiles or their tarantulas or their mantises, where they, they go to the pet store and they get a bunch of crickets, and then they you know put a bunch in there with it, and then the mantis or whatever their pet is will eat a whole bunch of them. They will gorge, basically binge on uh, that offering. And then you'll go to your cricket tank to feed your pet mantis the next day or a day later or whatever, and you'll see that the crickets are dead and they'll stink horribly, right? We've all had this experience. And you'll be like, oh, I, dang it, I forgot to put water crystals in my cricket tank or give them food to keep them hydrated or whatever it is. And uh, so anyway, um, the, the frequency of molts are dependent on uh, how often you're feeding the mantis and how, um, how warm you're keeping it. A uh, mantis, its metabolism will increase the warmer you keep it. And um, you will want to feed your mantis sort of on the basis of how quickly it's metabolizing its food, how skinny its abdomen is getting, how quickly it's getting, going from plump to thin. Um, of course, you never want to get paper thin, but um, so uh, the only other factor besides um, frequency of feedings and temperature is the age of your mantis. And so the distance or time between molts when they are young is shorter than as they get older. And so the you, you might wait a month or two for the very last molt where the sub-adult becomes an adult. So there you go. What do orchid mantis a cases look like and where do they attach them? Um, watch the last half of this video where you ask the question and you will see the answer because I have a whole bunch of orchid mantis footage in the last half of the video. 
Where do orchid mantises originate from? Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia, I believe, is the most common uh, place they are sourced from. Um, what is the best starter bugs? I touched on that already. Uh, what is my favorite invertebrate? I don't play favorites. Uh, what are your hobbies outside of bug keeping? That's called a long, awkward silence. There are none. What would each instar of the mantis feed on and what conditions would it need? And do I raise Lepidoptera? I do not raise Lepidoptera. Um, I have a care sheet on my website that I would highly recommend you review. Younger mantises start out on fruit flies. They often graduate to small crickets or house flies, sometimes to blue bottle flies after that and larger crickets. And then an adult mantis will eat whatever you feed it. <laughs> I'm joking, but it's sort of true. Um, next question. Recently, I have heard some people developing allergies to their pet feeder roaches. Have you ever had an issue with this in your own experience with cockroaches? Um, touched on this exact subject when somebody asked it uh, for the last set of videos that I did. I have never become allergic. Nobody in my household has ever become allergic through the various people I have lived with. None of my employees have become allergic. Um, I have known, you know, thousands of keepers. Um, some of you may not know this about me, but I have a web own a website called roachforum.com. And so I have talked to many keepers over the years about roaches. I have known just a couple to have developed allergies, uh, which I might argue that they probably had even before they stopped, started keeping roaches. Um, uh, a lot of people are allergic to a, a wide suite of things and roaches can be one of the many things those people are allergic to. So not me personally, and I will never be allergic to them. It's a mindset, you see. I absolutely adore mantids. I have a few, and they are my babies. Um, here's my question. What is your favorite species of mantis and why? Uh, this is, uh, I love your channel and website. I can't pick a favorite. I'm not going to pick a favorite. Um, I, I have a few that I like to recommend for you, but I do not have a favorite, and so I will... Uh, go to my default answer for these questions, and that is my favorite mantis species is the next species I see that I've never seen before. <laughs> uh, this person loves a giveaway. Um, will Creobroder pictopenis or Mardonius perillus acuticonus, the millipede, uh, make a comeback in my shop over the next couple of years? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what I'm getting next until basically I'm closing the deal on it. Uh, that's just the way it is. So um, they could be back on the website next week for all I know. And for the record, I would love to have any of them. And I will take this opportunity to let you all know that in addition to being a seller of insects, I am one of the largest buyers of insects. And so the things that are available on my shop.bugsandcyberspace.com website were often first and more often than not first purchased from other breeders, many of whom were uh, customers of mine prior to breeding them and then realizing that they have a lot of things, more things than they originally bargained for. And so I buy them back. Thank you for the question page. What is the average incubation time for an orchid mantis, a case, they said oethica. I often sort of translate in my mind the easier way of saying it when I know I'm speaking to a large number of people. So I will at this point say that the uh, scientific name for an egg case, a mantis egg case, or a roach egg case is an oethica, plural is oethici, and um, the average incubation time for one is probably about 40 days. Um, you could hatch one out at, in probably 30 days. It might take a little longer than 40 days. With an orchid mantis egg case, of course, you never give up on it. But if it's, if it's been over two months, you're probably not going to see it hatch. The rarest insect I've ever known, and this person's name appears to be in Chinese, um, 
could be Japanese. I'm not able to identify Asian languages, unfortunately, but um, I have a great respect for the Asian hobbies, and we'll talk about that someday. Uh, some, some amazing uh, work has been done in Japan with beetles, for example. The rarest insect I have ever owned. Ah, I was gonna say this is way too broad a question, but there's an easy answer to this. Simondoa conserfarium. I call it the extinct in the wild roach. Um, this species was, and this is a fantastic story, I love telling it. Um, this species, it's a roach that is only known to have existed in a cave in Africa which was mined by humans for a mineral called bauxite. Um, but before it was completely destroyed, scientists, including uh, uh, two people uh, uh, who co-founded the species, one of them being Piotr Naskarecki, uh, he saved the species. He brought it back to Harvard, I think it was, and raised it in captivity. And he reached out to me and uh, asked me, uh, he actually asked me for, for another kind of roach that uh, is a native species that's very difficult to acquire because he wanted to photograph it for a book he wrote called Relics. Um, and that species was uh, Cryptocircus. Um, but uh, he traded me, uh, not, be, not really a trade, but he wanted to, conserfarium means cons to conserve and he wanted to ensure the survival of this species. And so he gave them to me to help ensure their survival because he knew that I would distribute them to other keepers um, in the hobby. And so that's been one of, the, uh, one of the great pleasures of my career, my hobby career, is being a part of that. So that's the rarest because they do not, they are not known to exist in the wild any longer. Someone says, you're living such an awesome life. Props to you, dude. I've wanted an orchid mantis for a long while and I'm stoked you're hosting this. What was your first pet bug? I answered that already, so I'm gonna move on. Um, my last mantis pet was bonkers for bananas. Is it bad for them? A lot of people feed bananas to, um, to uh, mantises and also they're very uh, commonly offered to centipedes. And there are nutrients in there as well as moisture, moisture, moisture. And so um, they asked it about the sugar and if the orchid mantis could process it. And I would say yes, of course, you're not going to want to. Uh, an orchid mantis will not be sustained on banana alone. Um, it's a treat. I wouldn't uh, recommend allowing your mantises to eat it, you know, as a sole food. So. Um, as a treat, yeah, go for it. And it may be of great benefit to them as a supplement. I'm not really sure. I don't know that anybody's really sure, but you will find people out there that swear hey, by if it. If you like me, give me one of those thumbs up and please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.